Right. Um, thanks very much uh, for the invitation, and thanks uh, Wendy and Jacek uh, for putting this together. A wonderful opportunity to, to meet and interact with each other and talk about some ideas. Now, this is um, a topic I've been thinking about for a couple of months now. There's a lot of interest um, uh, today in, among policymakers, uh, people of companies, uh, public organizations, uh, private organizations about the value of work. Everyone is talking about how can we, in a changing culture, changing society, more global, more digital, how can we make sense of work, how can we uh, create um, committed employees, people who like uh, to work in a particular organization and stay there. So there's a lot of interest in this uh, topic, but I think in order to understand the challenges ahead of us, and I think Marianne will start talking about them uh, more after my talk, um, I'd like to go back, back to the future as we speak. What is history telling us about uh, work and how it's placed within a, a certain culture that we all came from? Now, first of all, I don't have to tell you about some of the challenges we face in the workplace today. Um, there are a lot of these climate surveys conducted in organizations about uh, stresses at work and depending on the quality of the research, uh, some uh, suggest that about 40 to 50 percent uh, of people suffer from uh, stress at work uh, induced by various stresses that you can see here. Other surveys come to um, figures as much as 80 percent or 90 percent of employees who suffer in one way or another from work stress. And that could be due to various factors. Here is a list of them. I do not know if you can see them, but uh, low salaries, high working hours, uh, interaction, interactions with your boss, um, no learning opportunities at work, um, workspaces that are not very uh, conducive to learn, not very inspiring. And so these are some of the factors that have been mentioned. And so I wonder if this has always been the case, or is this a byproduct of the way we have uh, developed a, a working culture? Um, and I think probably the answer is yes, because if you go back to our history, these are some of the uh, traditional societies that reflect the way we lived for 99% of our history as humans on this planet. We were hunter-gatherers. Um, these are the hut side on the left uh, top side, uh, the Bushmen left uh, bottom, uh, the Mayanga New Guinea, and here is uh, people from, I think from the Amazonian uh, rainforest. Traditional societies who also work, uh, but their work looks in a way very differently. And so if you look at hunter-gatherers, what you see is a what, what is called a minimalist lifestyle. Their needs are not so big as ours, but as a result their productivity is also not so high as ours. Um, but um, they live in small-scale societies, they're nomadic, uh, so hunter-gatherers. They have very limited material possessions because they move around, they cannot uh, carry everything uh, around, so only things that are really valuable to them they carry around, but they don't really care too much for material wealth. They, li they live and uh, work in extended family networks, highly interdependent, cooperative, egalitarian, but it's not sort of a, like a hippie society because uh, the egalitarianism is very strongly guarded, so there cannot be any tolerance for deviants or dominant individuals in the group. There's no formal hierarchies, there's no one boss, there's no decision-making hierarchies, and leadership is often uh, conducted um, situationally, and it's done on the base of prestige. Because you're a good hunter, you lead the hunt. Because you're a good diplomat, you're good with people, you negotiate uh, peace within your group or between groups, etc. Um, okay, so why do hunter-gatherers work? That's an interesting question. Uh, going back, as, it's, uh, as I said, 99% of our time, uh, or our history, going back so hundred, several hundreds of thousands of years, well, working is really an adaptation for um, fulfilling your needs for survival and ultimately reproduction. It means that you spend calories in order to obtain calories, and they are necessary to fulfill those needs. You have to eat, you have to find a place to sleep, uh, you have to drink, uh, you have to uh, be able to provide for your family, etc. So work by itself is not enjoyable, and I think probably we all know that. It's not enjoyable per se. So there are two different ways that you can look at work. One is work as 
toil, which is uh, toil, blood, sweat, and tears, which is a sort of unpleasant aspect of work, things that you, you have to do. You have to show up for work in the morning. Uh, you have to work with colleagues who may not be your friends, etc. But I think hunter-gatherers have managed to combine toil and play with one another. And so they've managed to combine the unpleasant aspects with the pleasant aspects of work. Um, and that is done through various ways. So hunter-gatherer work is it's varied. It requires a lot of skill, intelligence and knowledge. These individuals are generalists. They're not specialists like ours. Eh? We educate people to become specialists within a particular niche. That's all fine. But that really only relies on a narrow set of competencies. And so these individuals are generalists. They don't work too much. I'll show that, show that in a minute. They work in a social context. There is no work-life separation, private uh, circumstance and public and work conditions merge with one another. We have, in our culture, separated, at least Western culture. I think Eastern society does it differently. Uh, but uh, And I'm arguing that some of the ills of uh, the workplace today is because of this tight separation between work and uh, our private lives. We, we can argue about that. And work on any given day is also optional. If you don't want to join a labor effort, you don't want to go hunting today, that's fine. Nobody forces you. So you have an option of whether to work on a given day and with whom to work as well. Now, the, take, keep these kind of things into uh, mind because um, they have implications for the future of work and making a workplace a little bit more sane and healthy and mentally, um, uh, mentally good. All right, so they're generalists, not specialists. There's little division of labor. What there is is between the sexes. Eh? The hunting is generally done by males, the gathering by females. There's a lot of uh, interest and expertise in tool development. So if you're a good tool maker, you get a lot of expertise within these societies. You get a lot of scientific training, uh, but it's uh, what we call knowledge about how animals move. Eh? You have to track animals through a eh? particular area, you have to have knowledge about plants, which ones are edible, which ones are not. A lot of these expertise is shared and there's really a cooperative culture, so denying information to other individuals within your group is generally not a good thing, it's considered somewhat of a sin. And a lot of work is also physical, you have to actually track game, you have to walk for miles sometimes, tool making is also a physical activity and that I think is also something that uh, probably doesn't occur as much today. Not too much of it. Huh? This is um, it is controversial, I should say. But um, uh, anthropologists have estimated that um, the working week of a hunter gatherer is about 20 hours. So that's about three, four hours a day they spend on time which we could classify as work, and that's all they need to fulfil their basic needs. Of course, if you have a lot of higher needs, uh, you want to look live in a bigger house, a nicer car, whatever, of course you have to work probably more hours. But that's not an issue for these people. And so that means that they have ample time for social activities. So the idea that the past was a time when uh, there was a shortage of everything and people had to work very hard, well that's just bullshit. That may account for what happened during the industrial revolution or the agricultural revolution. But the 99% of our time we spend in these relatively affluent societies. And it's really sort of mind-changing for some people uh, when they realize that. But it's based on relatively solid evidence, I would say. And work, if it's done, it's done socially. So a lot of emphasis on teamwork, but it's done with family and friends. Even individual work is done socially. People chat about various things as they uh, work. Um, they chat about social relationships, uh, they chat about their children, um, because it's all done within that nuclear family or extended family. And work is highly autonomous. You can choose with whom to collaborate on a given day. You can choose whether or not to join a product. It's all up to you. Okay, so fast forward that to two shifts, I think, in history, which has, have defined the way we now currently talk and think about work. One is the agricultural revolution. For those of you who've read uh, 
Harari Sapiens, uh, and that there are some other writings as well, um, yeah, the biggest fraud in human history. We all think that the agricultural revolution has given us, brought us a lot of benefits, and of course it has, there is no denying about that. We are with more people, we have more resources on the planet, but there are also downsides to it. Uh, our, our definition of work has changed, we work many more hours now uh, to feed ourselves, as well as other, there's more pressures, there's more specialization, etc. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then we have the Industrial Revolution, and that has also caused some changes in the way we operationalize work, we define work relations, and not everything has been good. That's what I'm arguing here. And so the argument is really that as a result of the agricultural and industrial revolution, we have created an environment for ourselves where our bodies and our brains are not completely adjusted to. Of course, it also has brought some benefits, I've already said that, but I'm looking now at what are these discrepancies and how can we change the way we work in order to um, make sure that there is better accommodation or assimilation with our natural capacities, both what our bodies require, as well as what our brains require. So that's the argument we've been making with, with this mismatch hypothesis. Mismatch is everywhere. Huh? This is the poster child of the climate change movement. Uh, the uh, ice bear, or the polar bear, who is now in an environment uh, as a result of our efforts, uh, unsustainable efforts, where there's not enough ice for them to survive. I'm not sure if this is fake news, but it's a nice picture. Um, here you see actually how mismatch operates on organisms in terms of their brains, because this is a, a frog. A frog feeds on fireflies. The frog has a psychology that tells them that anything that gives light in the dark is food. But of course, they are faced with a situation, an environment where we manipulate light. We humans have created Christmas decoration. That's also a light in the dark. And if you have a brain that has an instinctive decision rule, anything light in the dark is food, then you face mismatch and the consequences are grave, of course. There's a lot of documented examples in the animal behavior literature. But of course our lifestyles, uh, this is uh, for bad food, uh, uh, spending hours on tele watching television with a beer and whatever, but also certain working conditions are very probably inconducive to our natural needs, natural desires, etc. So that's, I think, the, the, the remainder of my talk, my talk uh, where I'll talk about some of these mismatches. So I've depicted it here, thanks to Leander de Vries for making this uh, uh, picture, pictogram. Evolution of human work, it's how it's done originally. We have evolved various cognitive and behavioral mechanisms to support work, for example, uh, domesticating animals, whatever. We have found new ways of work, and as a result, there have been some mismatches, and we're stuck with these consequences. So let me talk to you through some mismatches. And again, I want to talk, this is about ideas, so this is speculative. And I'm trying to trace the problems we face in the workplace, i.e. work stress, I'm trying to trace that to th kind of changes that we have made in our modern work environment that may not be so conducive to the way our brains operate and what our bodies need. That's, that's the argument I'm building. Okay, so what about extreme speci specialization? Well, we now have jobs that uh, really rely on one maybe specific skill of an individual worker, the result of which is an immense boredom. A lot of people are bored in the workplace because they have to do stuff that really very narrowly uh, uh, relies on, on one particular skill or competence. Um, there's a problem with that. Extreme specialization also needs, uh, leads probably to layoffs because what happens if your little specialization is no longer required because a robot has taken over, then uh, your future as a worker is, is gone. So extreme specialization doesn't fulfill our needs, that's what I'm arguing, and it's probably also not good for our welfare. High workload, little autonomy. 
This is a result of a mismatch scale interdependent psychology. Remember that we evolved in these small social networks where relationships were manageable. But of course, we've created places like, I take this university, we have five or 6,000 staff members, 24,000 students, the result of which is an, in, an, an acceleration of communication opportunities. And of course, given that we are used to live and work in small-scale societies, we have developed a, uh, we have requests, but the result is in a situation where we are suddenly communication networks are expanding, that we face a lot of time interacting uh, and communicating, contributing to workloads. Now, an interesting uh, aspect of that is that we are, the current workplace uh, forces us to interact with lots of strangers, people that we don't necessarily have a strong uh, welfare connection with. That doesn't mean that some of your colleagues cannot be your friends, I mean, of course it can be, but on a day-to-day -day basis, unlike our ancestors, we're interacting with strangers, and we know from psychological research that that really uh, uh, puts a lot of pressure on, on our empathy system. It's much easier to empathize with my son or my wife than it is with all of you, I'm sorry to say, but, uh, and so burnout actually has been documented most widely among professions <laughs> where people interact a lot with strangers in education, for example, as a teacher with a lot of children whose welfare you really can't necessarily be bothered about, well, it's all it and you are, but, and the same with um, uh, doctors and nurses. So the empathy system is also in a sort of overdrive. And that's what the modern workplace forces you to do. The fourth is hierarchy. Of course, hierarchy is something that our ancestors probably also liked, because if you're a good hunter, then you get more status, and you get more food, etc. But our status psychology is also in some sort of overdrive, because we have so many opportunities to climb the corporate ladder. In some organizations, there are 10, 15 different levels that you have to ascend in order to get to land a top job. The result is a highly competitive uh, culture, um, and the result is also that you're always uh, working in hierarchies where you may not land this top job and you're faced with a boss uh, that uh, bosses you around. And then modern workspaces, well, they're also quite different from the workspaces that our ancestors for 99% of our history lived and worked in. This looks nothing like a natural environment in which people work in which people hunt and gather. Okay, so this is a mismatched ecology. Now, so all the arrows, whether it's about hierarchy, workplace, uh, specialization, all the arrows point into a direction that I think is bad for our psychological well-being as well as our physical well-being. So what should we do? Now, good companies already take the lessons of our evolutionary past, they should probably do it more and in a more explicit way, as I would argue. Offer meaningful work, and meaningful work to a lot of people is not extreme specialization, but work that, uh, in which people have to use different kinds of competencies. The ones that they're, of course, uh, trained for, but also some other uh, uh, competencies that they develop along, along the way. That means also offering opportunities for learning. Increasing freedom and autonomy in the workplace. At a 20% rule, that is what some companies apparently do, like Google, they allow you to work on your individual projects for one day a week. Uh, you can totally choose that yourself, and then at some point after half a year or a couple of months, you have to basically tell what you found or what you discovered. And then increasing playfulness at work. Uh, we have this uh, in our pantry now, a table tennis table, which might be nice, and this is a somewhat greener environment. And so these are some of the solutions, I think, that are being on offer for how can companies create workspaces that are probably more aligned with our evolved psychology. And I think this is already acknowledged by some of these organizations. Here. When they talk about the 21st century employee, it's about purpose, it's about choice, it's about harmony, and collaboration. This is an interesting one because in the West, we've chosen to separate work and family life. In the East, 
I don't know if you've seen the documentary American Factory on Netflix. I can really recommend that. It's really, you see a culture clash in how Americans think about work as basically a way to get a, a salary and how Chinese think about work as in an extension of their family or something that is even more important than their family. We can also choose to go that way, of course, and, and that will probably mean more harmony in the workplace, more connections with your colleagues, but it's a choice. Um, network, this is of course undermining the hierarchy. And I think I'm sort of done with my talk, so I don't know if there's plenty of room for questions, but thanks for your attention. Questions or comments? It's also possible because this is speculation to some extent. Lina. Yeah, how long does it take for our brains to actually adjust to this new situation? Because you could also argue that at some point we get used to the stress. So it becomes, right. a, it becomes a new norm. Ah, okay. So, so it's clear that biological evolution is a very slow process. So that basically means that it is really literally true that we are operating with Stone Age bodies and Stone Age brains in a new environment. That, that is literally true. Like the, the polar bear that suddenly that evolved in an area where there's lots of ice and suddenly there's no ice anymore. So that, that is truly true. The discussion is to what extent within our Stone Age brains, is there room for what they call plasticity? Can you learn new things, new ways? And yes, that is true. And culture is, of course, one of the adaptations that humans have to buffer against any environmental uh, changes. But culture by itself, that's what I'm arguing, is also a social experiment. We come up with cultures, uh, uh, I often cite the kibbutz, Kibbutz is a, a nice sort of experiment where you separate uh, children from the natural caregivers, the mother and the father, and maybe that works for one generation, but after one generation, mod particularly mother said, no, I don't want to live in a kibbutz if it means separating me from my child. So that's a cultural experiment that fails. Now, the modern workplace are also a lot of cultural experiments, and it may be that some of them are more sustainable than others, more attuned to the way our brains and bodies operate. And so I think it's a real question to say, well, yes, we can change the way we work, we can get used to stress levels, that's all fine, but ultimately you have to wonder, is this a cultural experiment that is sustainable? And then on sustainable, I'm talking about over tens or twenty or thirties of generations, uh, or maybe even hundreds of generations. And some of these are, are bound to fail, but we can make predictions about them. Yeah? yeah One more. Um, Sorry. If you look at the evolution of the human brain, So, so the, the desire for networking, that's of course built in, uh, because networking gives opportunities for trading, for example. And so the question is, well, do um, new technologies that will be created to uh, build larger net networks, do they fulfill their promises? And I think the research suggests no, because if you look at mobile telephones, for example, we know from research that people spend most of their time on the mobile telephone talking more with their inner circle. So it, it's not true that uh, social media, uh, smartphones have, have expanded your social networks to the extent that you now have friends all around the world and that you, instead of your five to eight friends, now have hundreds of friends. You may call them friends and Facebook likes to talk then uh, consider them uh, your friends, but they're really not friends in, a, in what we as psychologists take as a definition of friendship. So what all social media does, I think, is 
um, remove barriers for interacting more with the people we most trust, our family and our friends, so that they can live around the world in global, uh, they can move to South America or um, to Africa and we can still stay in touch. That's, I think, what the research uh, suggests uh, to this day.